I get into the call and I would say, Hey, Jason, this is Trent from the, um, the podcast. How are you? I'm good, Trent. What, what's up? How can I help you? Perfect. The reason I was giving you a call, Jason, is I was following up on the recent email I'd sent you. Does Blissful Prospecting Podcast ring a bell? Um, yeah. Who are you calling with again? Perfect. I'm calling from the Blissful Prospecting Podcast. And the reason I was calling you specifically, Jason, is I noticed that you were the chief prospecting officer and we help other folks in your position uh, blow up pipelines, drive more revenue, da, da, da. Um, are you available this week to set up a call? So breaking that down, we can, we can end the role play. So when I get into it, I'm saying, how are you? And I think that that's a really important question to ask because it, it, it gives you an immediate read. If they, if, they, if they say, I'm really good, how are you? You know you're in and you know that they're going to give you the time of the day. If they just say, I'm good and, and don't say anything back, you know you have to get directly into it. So I think that that gives you a read into their mood immediately and, and changes how I play the call. Based on that, I always start out with the reason I'm calling you is following up on an email. The reason I'm calling you is I noticed you oversee this role. The reason I'm calling you is that we help other leaders, da, da, da. People psychologically want to know who are you, where are you calling from, um, what does this mean for them? So give them the reason why you are calling them to start. And then to me, that that is the formula for nailing the first 30 seconds. And then of course, there's different segments of what is the value prop? What is the appropriate call to action? How do you overcome objections? But that is specifically how I've found is the most effective way to operate while cold calling. So uh, just being a content creator, I have to ask you, what made you decide to like actually start a YouTube channel and like document I your was sales working journey? For, I was working from home and like everyone, I got a little irritable being by myself so long. And I said, I want to start making videos. I want to connect and relate with other sales professionals. 634 videos on my YouTube channel later. Uh, we finally started to see some progress. And, and as you know, it's, it's a lot of fun, Jason. No, yeah, I was telling you before we hit record, big fan of your content, and I've just been seeing a lot of your videos. I was like, I got, I got to get this dude on the podcast, man. Um, so if we kind of like roll back a little bit just to going from an SDR to an account executive, I think is a really interesting thing. And we'll talk about that journey as well. But one of the things that just really sticks out to me is for an account executive, so much of your content is focused on outbound. and it's one of the big things that every VP of sales I interact with, that's literally on a list of their top three priorities is getting account executives to self-source. Can you talk about your mindset behind that and how you think about prospecting and like the the duty, I guess, that you feel to, to self-source your pipeline? A big misconception reps have is that they will out promote the need to cold call, to roll up their sleeves and do the dirty work, make the cold call, send the emails, do the prospecting. I, I view it in the light of the more I promote, the more success I have, the more I need to call, the more I need to do the activities that help contribute to that success. So I started my career at a fast growing software company right out of college. I had no internships, no experience no connections, started out as a sales development rep. And I know we'll get into some of that, that background as well and best practices and perhaps cold calling scripts as well. But when I promoted from SDR to account executive, I feel like I had mastered top of the funnel activity, cold calling, emailing, generating pipeline, um, whatever it takes to get those meetings um, and, and just get folks to be interested to take that initial meeting or selling time. So I wasn't exactly sure how my skills would translate to an account executive. As I've been an account executive for over a year and a half, um, closed over a million in revenue in the last six quarters, what I've realized is there's three key activities any account executive should disproportionately prioritize their time. And this is how I spend my day 24-7. Pipeline generation, pipeline health, and self-development. Pipeline generation, if I have 4x pipeline going into a quarter... I don't need the best close rate or the best talk tracks or the 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 most entertaining and engaging um, way of speaking with prospects to be in a good position to hit my quota. So I'm focused on sourcing my own pipeline at all times. Any SDR self source, any SDR source pipeline, that's gravy on top. That's how you get to the accelerators. Pipeline health, managing deals, um, qualifying demos, working sales cycles, self development. What skills do you need to improve upon to be better? I believe pipeline generation is mission critical to any account executive in 2022. Yeah, I love it, dude. You're speaking my language, man. 
Uh, how does this look sort of tactically in terms of how much time? How do you think about the time allotment, I guess? A lot of folks think about how do I prioritize my day? Um, and I, of course, I, I, or not of course, but I subscribe to the philosophy of blocking off time. So I have blocks of call for 30 minutes, find prospects for 15, send emails, all of that. I have a point system framework that I believe has been useful to me as an account executive who also needs to work deals. And I assign a corresponding point value with the activities that I believe contribute to the outcomes I want. So one point for adding seven prospects to my sequence, one point for every live conversation, one point for every set meeting, one point for every seven cold email sent, one point for every qualified opportunity. The goal each and every day is seven points. And the reason this point system matters is because everyone's worried about vanity metrics. How long did I spend calling today? How many calls did I make today? Um, whereas I look at it from an outcome standpoint, because if person A is making 100 calls and they're the most productive person in the office, but they have three live conversations, I make 50 calls and have six live conversations, that's more efficient. So I track the activities with a point system so I can leave the day and say, did I win the day today? Yes, no, uh, because the numbers don't lie. Yeah. Did you come up with that? How did you, how did you learn it? The credit is due to Kyle Acey. Um, he was a former employee at my company. He also produces content on LinkedIn. Um, one of the fastest people um, to go from SDR to uh, sales VP. Incredibly impressive. I had him on my podcast as well. I learned it from him in, in one of his uh, prospect or eBooks, um, but I've I've refined it to what I believe is the best because his point system has self development in it, which I think you can you can fake that a bit. Uh, but I learned it from Kyle Acey, so shout out Kyle. So it was not quite uh, logic logic driven enough for you. It sounds like you wanted something a little more concrete. <laughs> <laughs> as concrete as those bricks behind you. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> real concrete. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's solid. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of curious just about your personality. Are you, the way that you approach sales, are you like this in other areas of your personal life too? Are you this systems oriented and, and numbers driven and that, that kind of stuff? Where does that come from? I, I believe it's important to be all in in anything you're doing. I want to be obsessed with it. I want to do it to the best of my ability. Um, as a 20, recently turned 27 year old guy, I, I focus all of my time. I appreciate it. I focus all of my time on health, wealth, and relationships. And I, I believe that th that's basically where all of my time spent. So I don't, I, I have tried to create point systems for um, doing the activities I believe lead to those outcomes. So doing X amount of push ups in a day, reading X amount of minutes in a day. And I, I've tried that, but you get to a point where if you try and over regiment your life, um, although I like the discipline, and one could say that leads to, to freedom. Um, I think it's important just to live your life and think about what are your goals, write them down, go all in, work as hard as you can for them. Um, and it starts with the mindset and believing you can do it. Um, and I, I know yeah. in, in the sales content space, one hand, you have just the content work harder. And then on the other hand, it's, it's what is the actual tactical strategies that help you be more efficient and up-level skills. So I, I try and blend, blend both together. And I think it's really important. Yeah. Love it, man. Love the point system too. So if we look at that self-development bucket, how do you approach self-development? And I think a good question actually would be, how do you, how do you, how do you determine what you want to focus your self-development on? Well, step number one, Jason, is listening to every episode of the Blissful Prospecting podcast. So for those of you <laughs> watching right now, you can go ahead and tick the self-development box uh, today. You're getting better. Um, so we thank you for, for listening, watching, and subscribing. Make sure to watch until the end. So as I think about self-development, it's an infinite pursuit. Um, all of the most successful business leaders today would talk. I don't think they just they were just magically born with how do we how do we scale sales organizations? How do we find product market fit? How do we lead people? All of these skills are learnt behaviors over time. So it starts with subscribing to a growth mindset is just because I don't do something well today does not mean I cannot master it in the future. Anything I focus on, I believe I can get better. And when I identify an area of opportunity to get better at, it's a combination of self-awareness um, and also being coachable. And, and this is something I think is, is an opportunity for a lot of reps is no matter how good you are or how good people tell you you are, being open to coaching of, of a leader reviewing one of your calls or a peer saying, 
hey, I really respect this about your game, but here's something maybe you could think about. As soon as you start to identify these areas of opportunity, um, you can go focus on them and find that specialized knowledge, whether it be a podcast like this, going and speaking with a teammate who does it well. Outside of the office place, a, a big part of my mindset and, and philosophy around self-development is just listening to people that are doing cool things in the world, people that inspire me, business leaders, entrepreneurs, um, sales leaders. I like to absorb content from an audio standpoint, just purely listening. I like to read books and I like to watch a video as well. So I like to check all three of those boxes. I want to do it every day and I want to try and just learn new things and not just necessarily learn it, specialized knowledge. Go. It's important to learn and apply, but I think just when you have this positive information coming in, rather than scrolling on Instagram for five minutes, why not go listen to a motivational video on a podcast for five minutes? And I think that that will just pay off a lot more in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. It's a... Uh garbage in garbage out, you know, kind of situation. And, um, I think one of the, I'm curious your take on this too. One of the things I, I talk a lot about as relates to productivity is content cravings. So, you know, like when you eat junk food, oftentimes or really sweet foods or salty foods, it makes you kind of crave more junk food. And I noticed totally. that if you consume garbage content early in your day, so TikTok, let's say for example, I don't know if you have a TikTok or not. I had to delete mine. It was just crazy. I, I caught myself the first time I used it. I was scrolling for two hours watching 20, 30 second videos. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's madness. Yeah, it, it's absolutely crazy. But what I found is that what, if I watched it in the morning, I would actually crave distractions later in the day. I wanted those like little dopamine spikes. Are you really, I guess, what's your take on that? And are you really intentional about the content that you consume, let's say early in the day or prior to your work day and that sort of stuff? For me, at least it, I have an extremist viewpoint. So I'll preface to the audience with that. Um, for me, it's no social media, no television, unless you're using social media to make money, you should go ahead and shut it down in my opinion. And to simplify this even more social media, a lot of people use it to keep tabs on other people. I believe it should be used to build a brand and eventually sell a product. Otherwise, it's a colossal waste of time. Speaking to your reactivity point, I've experienced it in the past as well. Um, you're just sitting there looking for that quick fit, fix of dopamine or something relatable or, hey, I'm bored. Let me, let, me, let me go scroll whatever, TikTok. And you pull it up and then you're in this reactive mind state, should be thinking about work. And all of a sudden you're thinking about a sports team that you don't play for and then winning or losing does not contribute to your success whatsoever. So for me, at least I use social media to build my own personal brand and then monetize attention. I engage in social media deliberately for sources of inspiration and knowledge, which I think that, that that's really important as well. But a lot of people are reactive and, and just using it for that purpose. And that's okay um, because folks who are creating benefit from that. But I would consider asking yourself, what is, what is, how is it helping you? How is it benefiting you? And if, and if you're, and if you look at your screen time, like me, I looked at my screen time and said, I'm spending so much time on, on worthless activities. Um, now I'm less than 90 minutes a day. And I think that that's, that's the first, that's the actual action is what is screen time? Where is it being spent? How is it benefiting you? And those are really important questions to be able to answer. Yeah. So you don't watch any TV. I have a TV because I found it in my hallway. It was a nice 45 inch TV that was literally sitting being thrown out. I have it in my bedroom. It is not plugged in right now and has not been plugged yeah. in in over four weeks. So I don't watch TV. This is something um, about a year ago I got, I got away from. And, oh, wow. and it, the reason I did it was because the only way you can actually consistently create content and, and aspire to make money online is you have to replace that TV time with productivity time. It's the only way. Yeah. So you don't watch TV shows on your computer or anything like that? I watch YouTube videos. I watch YouTube videos. Um, so I, I would say that's my that's my guilty pleasure in a way. But yeah. but I try and focus it on the the areas that I think will benefit me in yeah. some way. That's not to say yeah. I slip and like to watch some some entertaining stuff uh, from time yeah. to time. But but no, if you were to go walk, I mean, th this is my living room. There's no TV. Yeah. I relate with you on the the extremism where sometimes there's certain things for me, I have to not do any of it. Otherwise I will do too much of it. Totally. <laughs> you know? And uh, it sounds like a, a big part of your success too is, and you've used this word self-awareness. How do you practice self-awareness? What does that look like for you? So I, I do all of those check the box items that you would think someone who claims to be self-aware and does um, meditate, 
uh, Monday through Friday. I just go sit on my balcony. There's no objective. There's no outcome. I just sit there and just I'm, I think sometimes thinking, sometimes not. Um, I journal. I would say between three to five times a week, and that primarily consists of writing down goals and just what do I like about my life right now? What do I don't like? Because I believe if you want your life to get better, you need to get better. So it's identifying, yeah. am I comfortable where I'm at? And I think the answer most people have is no. And my drug is the future. So I'm thinking, what do I want to do in the future? And what is the gap between where I'm at and where do I want to go? So what needs to happen in that gap? So knowledge is a big part of that. Knowledge leads to productivity. But I think the root of all of this self-awareness is actual action because you can be thinking about the right things. You can know the right things to do, but if you fail to take action, none of it matters. And on the other hand, if you have the wrong information, then you're taking action. It's not going to work out. So I think it's a balance of understanding where are you going first and foremost, taking action. Is, is it working? Are you making progress? Or what information do you need to then go accelerate the journey? or um, change the journey or open up a new path. So I think there's a lot of different variations to that. And, and it's important to, to listen to stuff like this. And, and speak, speaking with people like you right now, it, it's helping opening my eyes to different ways of thinking about things. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's part of the journey. Yeah. What are your goals? From a goal standpoint, what I write down every morning is that I have built a $10 million ARR software company. I have 1 million subscribers on YouTube. Um, and then some of my other goals are more so relationship and health related goals. But from a career business standpoint, that's my primary focus and outcome. Um, and then as I think about that, that's cool to talk about, but how do we actually get there? So immediately I want to get to enterprise, perform there. Um, and then ultimately, I, I think I'll need to collaborate with some other people who are more technical. But you don't need to have all the answers today. But I think it starts with what is the goal? What is the outcome? And I'd like to build a software company. Yeah, killer. So correct me if I'm wrong. The way that you kind of think of this is I want to have kind of a North Star so that I know all of this effort and this energy I'm putting in is at least pointed in the right direction. Ask yourself, employee one who works at Chick-fil-A, who's there to collect a $15, minimum, $15 minimum wage paycheck, think, think about how successful they're going to be. Whereas employee B, they want to own a chain of five Chick-fil-A restaurants. They're going to care a little bit more about the way they make the fries, the way they take the orders. So working at a SaaS company, I think it's a billion dollar ARR company seeing what processes do we put in place that work, that don't work? Where do we invest our money? What our biggest department sales, our second biggest is engineering. Why is that? Where are we investing? How do we position ourselves as the category creator and leader? These are all learnings that then can be applied to my own aspiration at some point in time. So I think when you have that North Star or that outcome of the reason this work matters today is because it's going to pay off in the future, I think it helps me to be all in one and also, um, just enjoy the good and the bad because there's a lot of bad to the life we live. Yeah, I imagine it helps you ride that kind of roller coaster like you're talking about, and also helps like with the daily discipline, especially around prospecting. It's a grind, dude. You know, prospecting every day, especially when you're an account executive and doing other stuff. And I and uh, having some perspective of how this fits into the grand scheme of things, or at least in the next year or two, year, whatever it is, um, I find that to be incredibly helpful to get through the grind of stuff. It doesn't feel like a grind when there's, nothing, when there's purpose behind the activity, you know? It, you're exactly right. And, and, and I view it as nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems. So yeah. I try and leave the day in, in a neutral place of, of, of one, did I win the day? Yes, no, it's important to answer that. But sales is a contact sport. You got to go out of your way. You got to interrupt people's days. And it's uncomfortable to do that. We're programmed to not do that um, because um, it, it, it is not pro survival to interrupt people's days and, and get rejected. So yeah. it can be tough, but it's all a part of the process. Yeah, I uh, let's let's get into prospecting. So this is this is your jam. You, you talk about cold calling, especially a lot, but I love that you call it a contact sport. Um, was there a learning curve for you, by the way, with cold calling? Was that something that was ever uncomfortable for you? I never naturally came in and was just, it just crushed it. As I said, I had literally no experience. I was a babysitter. I never had an internship. I mowed lawns. So I, it's not like I'm some sales guy that just knew what to do and had that right internship or that right job. 
I didn't know what software sales was until I started and they handed me a headset and they said, you're going to be calling, you're going to be emailing. I didn't know what pipeline was. There's all these buzzwords, the SDR, BDR, what does this even mean? So within the first few weeks, I get trained. They give me a script. I'm robotic. Um, you're around all of your colleagues. So everyone hears you. You see this public dashboard where you're placed against your colleagues. And um, they said, Trent, you sound like a used car salesman. You're talking incredibly fast. I didn't know what I was talking about. If the prospect said, okay, it's your Trent, how does that actually work? I'd say, I, I really don't know. So it took probably four to six months for me to really feel like, okay, I'll set any meeting I get on the phone. At least I'll believe that. But in reality, my set rate's probably 15% if we're being realistic. So it's important to understand those metrics. The, 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 the turning point for me was early on, I was one of the worst performing SDRs my first month with the quota. And I went and spoke with the senior sales leader in the office because I was, I was like a sales for me. What do I do? And he's like, you're probably trying hard, Trent, but are, are you truly all in? And that's one of our foundational values of the company. And I said, I was, I was thinking, well, if it doesn't work, I'll just move back home. Like I'll, I'll go get another job. But when I got to the point where I burnt the Brit, the ships, and I said, you know what, we're going to take the island and we're going to die here. I'm going to figure it out. I'm not just going to hop companies. That allowed me to then be open to the right feedback, the right information, and then deciding I'll make more calls than everyone else. And that's the key is just making more calls. So I started deliberately making between 90 and 100 calls Monday through Friday, 2000 calls a month. And through extreme repetition, I believe 50,000 cold calls, I've probably done over 10,000 hours of it. Um, so I think I've mastered it. And you just learn what to say, the pitch, tone, inflection, how to make the ask. Um, so I think it comes with experience and you have to get the reps. You can't learn from a textbook. You have to, you can learn, but then you have to apply it. You got to make the calls to learn it. Yeah. That diligence, the going hard versus all in. I, I really like that. I've never really thought about it from that way. Cause there are so, I don't know. What, what's your take on, like, when you look at the reps across a company, what percentage of them do you feel are unsuccessful because they're lazy? It comes down to who's there to collect a paycheck or who is there yeah. to advance the company mission forward. And ask yourself, which bucket do you fall in? Do you truly believe in the company, the product, what you're doing? Do you see yourself at the company for the next three to five years? And what I'm observing, we're naturally low unemployment. It is a, it is a favorable job market. People that are not happy can snap their fingers and then go get a promotion elsewhere. So that so that they they have this false sense of, well, I don't need to actually do the work. I'll promote up to the next position. I'll pro promote up to the next position. Eventually you're gonna reach a place where you have out promoted your skill set and your your career will plateau. So all in to me means saying, I'm gonna make this work no matter what. Even if it takes two years to promote, it took me two years as an SDR to promote. Um I, I accepted the offer. They said it would take four months. So Things take a long time and it takes longer for, for other people. So as for an actual percentage, I don't have that. But what, but what I can say is when you get to a point where you say, I'm going to make this work no matter what, um, I think that that's, that's, a, that's the right place to be in because then you're just, it's the founder's mentality. It's something our, our founder, owner of the Utah Jazz talks a lot about is, is hey, we don't know what's going to happen. It's probably going to be a tough road ahead, but we're going to make it work and it, it, our survival is dependent on it. Yeah. The reason why I asked that question is I think that that gets thrown out a lot by people like me that do sales training. They like to, or sales leaders too, they like to just say that reps are, are lazy, you know? And uh, I think it's it's a lack of commitment, which I, I do think that those are two very different things. And you know, not being committed to something versus being lazy feels like very different. You know, on one hand, it's it's like I know what to do. And I don't do it <laughs> because right. whatever reason. And this commitment thing is, it's like this laser focus around the activity. It's when I do connect with someone on a cold call, I'm hyper-focused. I'm making everything out of that call. And I find that a lot of people kind of just go through the motions. It's just easier to do that. You know, wh where does the founder's mentality come from for you? I mean, you mentioned that you have a goal to start a SaaS business? Like, where did all of that come from for you? Did, did you always want to run a business? Where, where did that come from? I think it starts with setting a target and asking yourself, what is the life you want to live? And I believe the work you put in your 20s will allow and shape the quality of life you live in your 30s and vice versa, 40s, 50s. So I always just wanted to be wealthy. I want to be wealthy. I want to have flexibility around what I work on, who I work with, where I live, the quality of life, because I, I follow these business leaders that that are the the billionaires, the the the, the big business guys, and you, you see their life and you say they have complete control 
over the most important asset that we all share, which is our time because it's limited. So the more successful you are, the more time you have. And I think the higher quality of life you can live. So you need money to do that. So for me, that's why I disproportionately prioritize the wealth bucket at this point in time. I'm willing to sacrifice a bit on health because the wealth right now as a 27 year old guy, I think I need to focus on this so that I can set myself up later in life. And, and I think as you think about t to the point you were making around people know what to do, but they just don't do it. It, it all starts with their targets and their goals. And, and I hear reps in these meetings, they say, I just want to hit my quota. I just want to not get fired, whatever it may be. So you're either contracting or you're basically, um, you're getting worse. And, and I, I try and set goals that are in excess of my actual quota. And if you look at it, you can say, one, you can work harder your willpower can increase, but you eventually max that out to a point where you can't make more calls. So that's where the skill component comes in, the efficiency. And that's why podcasts like this one are so important in conversations around what tactical skills do you do aside from just making more calls? What do you say? How do you approach it? How do you structure your day? Um, so those are the two levers I believe any rep can pull to begin making more money today, skill and will. Skill and will. Love it. So uh, let's talk about the cold call. So what are your philosophies around the call? And if we could kind of break it down almost into chunks too, how do you like to introduce the call? Like what, what, what do you feel is the purpose, I guess, of, of the cold call? We can kind of start there. The purpose of the cold call is to sell time. You are not there to go into a deep overview of your solution or what it's going to mean for them. Um, I think a lot of reps are, are paralyzed by needing to over-prepare and this was the biggest mistake I made when I first started cold calling is I was sitting there at my desk. I had a pro list of prospects to call. I was excited. Um, and, and and I was sitting there one day just ready to make calls. And, and my desk mate next to me, she had been there about a year. I was about two, three months in. She's like, she's like, what are you doing? Um, I'm like, I'm preparing for this call. I was looking at the, I was looking at the LinkedIn page. I was looking at the company website, the prospect, the, the account notes. She's like, just press call and figure out what to say after. So I, that, that to me is the best philosophy to, before you start making calls, press call yeah. and then figure out what to say. Given if you're an enterprise rep and you have 10 accounts, you, you probably want to do a little bit of preparation, but the majority of us who, who have a lot of accounts, um, SDR account executives, even just press call and figure out what to say later. So it starts with making the dials. When I get into the actual dial, I have a few cold call principles that I'll share here today. Um, it starts with, um, what you say isn't as important as how you're saying it. And this comes through the experience piece. Um, so when you initially, you got to find your right voice. Um, I almost call it the DJ voice in a way. So you have the upward inflection, the downward inflection, taking appropriate pauses. So when I get into the call, I'm going to try and sound authentic and I'm just going to try and come across as a normal person first and foremost. When I get into the actual call, um, an additional cold calling principle is if the call feels rushed, it's you who are rushing the call. Because a lot of the time you're going to be immediately met with one of those, Hey, I'm in a meeting. Uh, who are you? How'd you get my number? Local area code. What is this? What, what are you saying? Are you trying to sell? Is this a sales call? They'll, they will try and artificially speed up the conversation. So controlling the pace at all times, like LeBron James with the basketball, you got to control the pace at all times. And if it ever feels rushed, it's you who are rushing it. When we get into the actual call, my cold calling opening line um, and a lot of different folks have different perspectives on this. Some folks will say, can you, th Hey, this is a cold call. Do you have 27 seconds for me to tell you the reason why I'm calling da da da. Um, some folks don't like to say, how are you? I get into the call and I would say, Hey, Jason, this is Trent from the, um, the podcast. How are you? I'm good. Trent, what, what's up? How can I help you? Perfect. The reason I was giving you a call, Jason, is I was following up on the recent email I had sent you. Does Blissful Prospecting Podcast ring a bell? Um, yeah. Who are you calling with again? Perfect. I'm calling from the Blissful Prospecting Podcast. And the reason I was calling you specifically, Jason, is I noticed that you were the chief prospecting officer and we help other folks in your position uh, blow up pipelines, drive more revenue, da, da, da. Um, are you available this week to set up a call? So breaking that, we can, we can end the role play. So when I get into it, I'm saying, how are you? And I think that that's a really important question to ask because it, it, it gives you an immediate read. If they, if they, if they say, I'm really good, how are you? You know, you're in and you know that they're going to give you the time of the day. If they just say, I'm good and, and don't say anything back, you know, you have to get directly into it. So I think that that gives you a read into their mood immediately and, and changes how I play the call based on that. 
I always start out with the reason I'm calling you is following up on an email. The reason I'm calling you is I noticed you oversee this role. The reason I'm calling you is that we help other leaders, da, da, da. People psychologically want to know who are you, where are you calling from, um, what does this mean for them? So give them the reason why you are calling them to start. And then to me, that that is the formula for nailing the first 30 seconds. And then of course, there's different segments of what is the value prop? What is the appropriate call to action? How do you overcome objections? But that is specifically how I've found is the most effective way to operate while cold calling. So in your experience, what percentage of the time should you get past that first 30 seconds into the next part of the call? I would say I would say close to 90% of the time um, because the yeah. only reason you're not going to get to that point is if they hang up on you or if they, they blatantly give you just a, I'm in a meeting. And then you'll say, well, I hope I got you out of a boring meeting. A lot of the time it's just made up. So you cannot go away easy. And, and I always push back and I say, Look, I don't want to. I don't want to waste your time later. I'm going to keep calling you back. Can I? Can I just have 30 seconds to tell you the reason why I'm calling? And then that usually will get me into. Okay, go ahead. So, 90 yeah. percent of the time, you you should be able to at least get into the call. Have you tried the? I would agree with that. Yeah. If, if there's something very wrong with your intro, if you're not getting into the next call 90 percent of the time, have you tried the Gong? How have you been? Line at all? Absolutely. Versus how are you? Yeah. Absolutely. It's thoughts? effect it's yeah. effective, especially if if they've spoken with somebody in the past, if they're a current customer, um yeah. especially the lost opportunity current customer or or maybe if they've interacted with your company, maybe follow them on LinkedIn. I think the how you've been catches them off guard. I use it frequently, um but in in a way it's situational based. If it's a complete cold prospect really high level, I may not do it because I don't want to rub them the wrong way. And I think the how are you is just so neutral that it, it, it will. I, I like the line. I like the line. How have you been? It works. Yeah. So if you get a read, let's actually backtrack a bit because there's a lot to unpack that you did. You talked about tone. So what are the intentional things that you're doing with your tone? You mentioned low, low DJ voice, like Chris Voss style stuff. Like what's the, what, what are you doing intentionally with your tone? never split the difference. Um, the, the tone, this is, this is what's challenging for me because a sign of a great salesperson that correlates to a leader, they're able to teach a scalable process. Whereas when I say tone, it's almost intangible in a way. And when I say use the right tone, I think that that can mean a different thing for me than it means for you based on your voice, based on how you speak, based on how you operate. So an example of my tone is I would say, Hey, Jason, this is Trent from Qualtrics. How are you? So I, I'm not necessarily trying to sound like someone I'm not. I'm 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 trying to speak like I'm speaking with a friend in a way, um, but almost just but keep it professional in a, in a way. So um, I wish I had a, a a more articulate way of saying you want to use an upward inflection at this point in the thing, and then downward inflection there. So it's really m- more of a what feels right for you, just so people are agreeable enough to hear you out. Yeah. I always like the visual of and you know, always tell us to picture asking for help at like a restaurant or a store. That tonality, I've heard someone, I can't remember who it was, refer to it as lost traveler tonality. I like like how you would you know, back in the day, you're 27, I'm 33. I'm not much older than you, but I did have to use MapQuest when I learned how to drive. You know, I had to print out, <laughs> Printing out the, the directions <laughs> and then you make one yeah. wrong turn and you're finished. And then you got to go ask someone for directions. Which yeah, for me yeah. was always a horrifying thing because I never liked talking to, to people like that or asking for help from strangers. But it's the hey, do you know where yeah one two three A Street is? That tonality can be pretty effective too. I love what you said about controlling pace because there's this inherent need I feel that a lot of people have to mirror the prospect. They take it way too literally. So if the prospect talks really really fast, they talk really really fast. And if I'm hearing you correctly, you just keep your normal tone. No matter how rushed the prospect sounds, I'm still going to talk in my normal tone like this. The self-awareness piece comes into play. If they're if they're deliberately trying to rush you, that changes the way you need to play the call, first and foremost. So your strategy needs to change. That means you need to get immediate to the point. But the reason I say yeah. that it's important to control the pace is because 
a lot of the objections and the reason why reps don't get to the point where they're they're able to actually make the ask for time. And that's a really that's another really important principle when you talk about making the ask for the actual meeting. Um, but in order to get to that point, you cannot allow them to rush you off the phone. And and in reviewing cold calls with my SDR leader way back when, um, the feedback he said is is I would get flustered um, or or I would feel like I needed to artificially um, change the way I was talking to them based on them saying they're in a meeting. So I need to rush it all of a sudden. If they want to rush it, I can't control that, but I can control the manner in which I operate with the prospect. And I'm always being very controlled. Um, and I mean, I'm sure subliminally I'm, I'm mirroring them in a way, but it's just, it's just talking at the exact same speed that you would talk normally. And I think that this, this stops them in their tracks of it because they realize this person's not going away easy. I may as well just hear him out. And that's the thinking behind it. Yeah. Love it, dude. Love it. So what happens next? So we do our opener. Where do we go to next? You get the opener. And then a really important part of the conversation is I like to ask a broad open-ended question. So mm -hmm. I'm selling to HR leaders. Um, and, and dependent on the buyer persona you're selling to, it's really important to understand <clears throat> what do they care about? What's going on in their world? Ask yourself, what is the outcomes they care about? So if it's an HR leader, it's attracting talent, it's retaining talent, it's developing people. If it's a marketing leader, maybe it's increasing customer satisfaction, revenue, whatever. Maybe if it's an IT leader, um, I tool effect, I couldn't even tell you what an IT leader cares about. But what I can tell you an HR leader cares about are those three outcomes. So my solution helps them achieve those outcomes. And we help them do that by collecting feedback. So I know that they care about that in their world and, and those buzzwords matter to them. They understand it may not make sense if you've never sold to an HR buyer. As soon as I ask the, how are you? The reason for my call, um, da, 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 is I'm saying, is employee feedback or employee engagement a priority for you and your team this year? To put this in perspective, it's similar to asking you, Jason, is water an important part of your day? you're going to almost say, yeah, yeah, of course it is. I want to ask them a broad open-ended question that begins to target the conversation and move it in the direction where I want to play at. I want to get them in this side of the pool. I want them to, to identify and say, yes, yes, this is something, of course, this is something we have to focus on because they all focus on it. Is employee engagement, employee feedback, a priority for you, you and the team this year? Most of the time they're like, yes. Or they're like, yeah, yeah of course it is. If they say no, then that's concerning. Um, and it may not be the right question to ask. If they say no, I then know I have to completely convince them of the value of doing this, which means it, it may not be actually on their radar. So it's going to be harder to actually sell them a deal in the first place. So it comes down to setting the right types of meetings because I could call into any prospect and try and set time. But is it a prospect who may actually buy my complicated high ticket long deal cycle solution? I don't know. So I want them, I want to understand is what I'm selling even in your ballpark of what you care about. Most of the time, at least 70, 80% of the time, they're going to say yes. I'm going to say perfect. Um, so that's that part of the call. I want them to qualify themselves so that now they're a bit more receptive to what he is about to tell me is at least somewhat relevant to what I focus on. And then you immediately get into your value proposition. And I'm going to say, okay, perfect. Well, the reason I was calling you specific, Jason, so I noticed that you oversee the HR vision and strategy at Blissful Prospecting. We work with other leaders like yourself to identify the greatest points of friction in their business so that they can improve employee engagement, retention, and productivity, the outcomes we talked about before. And then I'll immediately go into the ask. Being that you value insights like these today, let's set up a brief introductory conversation so that I can share more about how you can benefit my, from my solution. How does this Friday at 2 p.m. work? And at that point, they're either going to agree to the call and we're less than two minutes in because I want to get to the ask quickly. There's data around the longer the call goes, the better. I think that that, that is true and that's important, but get into the ask quickly. They'll either agree or most of the time they'll give you an objection. We don't have budget, yeah. not important, da, da, da. And then you'll have to figure out how to overcome those objections to justify the meeting. That to me is the simplest way to think about cold calling. Made 50,000 cold calls. That works for me. And I believe it's yeah. universally applicable to any product, service, or solution. Yeah. 
So we have some different philosophies in a few areas. This would be kind of fun to go back and forth on, dude. Um, the broad open-ended question. Do you have you tested doing something more specific right there too? I y- yes, yes, I I have tested things more specific. If it's a if it's a very so dependent on the product you're selling. This is of course dependent on the product you're selling. If I'm selling more of a super niche product, then maybe I'll be a bit more specific. Um, but I'm selling across all industries, um, all different yeah. sizes of companies. So I, I found that to be most effective. So I don't necessarily use that a bunch, but I'm curious to hear what, what you have. Yeah. Uh, the approach is fairly similar. I, I call them priority drops. So I teach something where we go kind of detailed right there for maybe 20, 30 seconds. So I'm just going to wing this part because I don't know HR as well. Um, it might be, um, well, Trent, um, I'm working with a lot of HR leaders at companies like X and Y, and we hear a theme around really two things. One is uh, attracting more applicants. So we're posting jobs and XYZ is happening. We're not able to attract the right talent, or it's more of a bottom of the funnel you know, type of focus where we're getting applicants in, but for whatever reason, they're choosing not to work with us. Are either of those two a focus for you right now? So like a little bit of detail and I totally wing that middle part, but I'm curious what your take is on that. I I find that to be effective because I can demonstrate a little bit of business acumen around my understanding of the priorities. But it sounds like your goal is to kind of get like a oh, duh, yeah, of course I'm working on it. I find the kind of opposite to be true, where if I can demonstrate business acumen, especially to executives, it's like, okay, cool. This person gets my world, you know, type of thing. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I call that the educated assumption. And I think it's effective. I think in a way it's getting to the same outcome, which is hopefully setting a meeting. Maybe my path is just longer. If I'm calling a really high level prospect at a top account, I probably will not just say, hey, well, the reason why I'm calling you is I'm following up on an email or or a complete broad open into question. The point you made is is a unique, relevant market insight of what of basically you know what they care about and you're telling them a unique way of thinking about it and how you can help solve the problem you know they have. And then and then asking, is this something you face? I think if you're specific like that and you nail it, then you then you get then they're gonna be much more receptive to what you say next. And I think that that approach would be more effective than just a broad open-ended, well, is this general term or this general program um, a priority for you? That to me is is more universally applicable and probably works for lower level prospects or directors or some VPs as well. But if you're calling a really important high level prospect, I do think your strategy um, would probably be more effective than a broad open-ended question. But to, but to, with, that being, with that being said, well, if I confirm, hey, is engagement feedback a priority? my next statement is then some, something similar to what you had said. So after you confirm yep. this general thing is important to you, then I'm going to validate that with, hey, I know your world. Let's talk. Yeah. And it almost serves as kind of a reverse value prop too, where it sort of answers the question of what do you do? Well, these are the outcomes. You'll still get asked that question. You know, what do you guys do at XYZ company or whatever? But I've sort of answered the what we can help you accomplish piece, which is which is kind of interesting. Um, okay. So when you go in and ask for the meeting, do you get objections? Is that where you usually get the most objections is when you ask for the all meeting the at the end? Or? All the time, all the time. Yeah. And, and when I think about objections, just because they tell you no, doesn't mean they're not interested. No is never a dead end. So an analogy for this is if I were to say, Hey, Jason, do you want to go get pizza tonight? You may say, no, I, no, I don't want to go get pizza tonight. I'm like, well, what about this doesn't work for you? And maybe you say, well, I already ate. I'm not hungry. And I'm like, well, why, why don't you just why don't you just come with me anyway? Maybe you'll get hungry when you're there. Um, the initial objection you gave me was just, you don't want to go. Layer deeper is, is no, I, I'm full. And then when I continue to push back, we'll, conti- we'll get to the real objection. Maybe you um, lactose intolerant like me, and maybe you just don't want to go. Maybe you're like, hey, I just can't eat cheese. That is the real objection. We need to get to what is the real objection? Why do you actually not want to go get pizza with me? And then maybe I can say, well, believe it or not, this pizza shop I'm recommending has a gluten-free option. Boom. Immediately you're going to go. So when you're faced with an objection, it's important to understand what is the actual objection. Most of the time, they're just going to tell you, no, not right now. You can't give up. Yeah. You can't fold. You got to say, 
well, what about this doesn't work for you? Or if you really want to double down, it, it's unique to depending on what you're selling, what you're doing. But but if, if you could validate at the beginning, well, hey, you said this was a priority. Um, anytime you can hit on the, the negative consequences or the implications of them doing nothing or as a result of not talking to me, this is what it can mean to you. I think you need a couple different ways to combat that so that you have ammunition. And oftentimes they, they may say, well, we already have something in place today using your competitor. Okay. Uh, well, what would you change about that? Is there anything you would change about the program? How are you? How, how you don't want to get them to explain everything, but when you get that objection, what is the real objection? When they tell you no, push back to really understand what is the root cause, so that you can at least put yourself in the best position to then overcome it. And keep in mind, we are just trying to sell time. Hey, I'm just looking for 15 minutes of your time. This is the reason why it makes sense. They need to believe it's a good use of their time. Yeah. What is the call to action for you? What what do you promise that they'll get in return for 15 minutes of their time? I try and get them to agree to take the meeting. And then to your point around the actual outcome of that meeting, um, a strategy to increase show rate, them actually going to the meeting and then being more um, invested in participating in the meeting with me is I'll say, well, perfect. And then I'm going to outline the agenda. During those 30 minutes together, I hope to discuss how you're thinking about this process today. I plan to come prepared with ideas and ways we've helped similar organizations to yours improve their business. If we both agree there's alignment, we'll continue the conversation. If, it, if not, we absolutely can part ways. What would you add to that agenda? And I, 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 will, I try and quickly tell them this is the exact agenda. This is what they can expect so that they're more inclined to say, okay, well, I agreed. I understand, I, I understand more about how, what his actual intention is. Um, and, and I committed to it. And I think that will improve show rate and also just get them more invested in being excited about it. And then that comes into you sending your follow-up, you adding value until that point. So there, it all comes down to how do you get on the phone with the right people? How do you get them interested? How do they get them to show up? And then how do you continue to convert it into actual legit qualified pipeline? Yeah. So we got a few minutes left here. I want to hit on objection handling. What framework or principles do you kind of uh, align with when it comes to objection handling? When it comes to objections, um, as I said, it's important to understand what is the objection. And before you can understand the objection, I think it's important to reaffirm back to them that you listen to what they said. So if you were to say, yeah, Trent, I don't want to, um, I don't want to get pizza tonight, I would say, I, under, I understand you don't want to get pizza tonight. Or if, or if they would say, yeah, well, we don't have any money. I'd say, well, look, I'm certainly not asking you to spend any money today. I'm immediately repeating back what they just said in a different way, validating, I heard you. As soon as you yep. give them that, I've heard you, you then have the airspace to then go back and try and overcome it. So I don't necessarily have a silver bullet because realistically, a, a good set rate is going to be around 15%. And, and the reason why oftentimes you, you don't set meetings is because maybe they're just not going to be receptive in the first place, even if you give the best rebuttal possible. I think it's important to understand your competitors really well in the market landscape. So if you get an idea of who they're using or how they're going about it, quickly being able to pull out of your hat, well, hey, other customers I work with, the reason why they've typically switched from that to this is X, Y, Z, or hey, we can add value in tandem the way you're thinking about this today. Oh, I know you're a year out from focusing on this priority, um, but the reason why it matters to look at it now is X, Y, Z. So I think it comes down to product knowledge, industry knowledge, competitive landscape, so that as a part of your rebuttals to objections is, is, is providing that value and compelling enough of a reason for them to rethink why they're not interested in the first place and decide, you know what? Um, sure, it, it would be stupid of me not to take 20 minutes to hear this person out. Yeah, I think that's the key there, what you shared at the end. It would be stupid of me not to. You know, you're giving me an offer that's hard to refuse. It, it would be really tough for me to not want to know what other top sales trainers and consultants are doing to grow their businesses right now. It'd be foolish of me not to take that meeting, you know? And a line um, I like to say is by the end of that conversation, you will either be all the more confident in your sh solution today, or you'll immediately see that there's a better way of doing things. Um, you can change the, the wording on that a bit, but I think just giving them that out of, hey, there's no commitments here. It's not like you're signing a contract with us. It's just an exploratory conversation. Um, if you care about understanding what's happening now, um, that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. 
Love it, dude. Um, I got like three rapid fire questions for you. You ready? Let's do it. All right. So this one's just kind of a fun one because we don't have to choose between them. But if you had to choose between phone, email, and social for prospecting, what do you pick and why? Phone. Um, phone, because it's my favorite. I, I think that there's nothing beats getting a prospect on the phone, talking to them, and they're much more emotionally inclined and, and connected to you because they've spoken with you, not just name on a screen. What's something you believe about sales that most would disagree with? I believe that if you miss your number, it's 100% your fault. It's not marketing's fault. It's not your book's fault. It's not you not feeling ready's fault. It's 100% your fault. Interesting. Uh, Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to yourself as a rookie sales professional? Begin building and establishing a personal brand earlier. Um, I didn't begin creating content until I promoted from SDR to AE. And some would say, well, I don't know what to talk about. If I could go back, I would have just started posting on LinkedIn more frequently, posting YouTube videos, doing whatever I could to be known in and outside of my company because I believe that money follows attention. It opens up opportunities. And that's what got me in front of Jason here today. Yeah, I love it, dude. Well, make sure if you're listening, subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that kind of stuff before you take off. And Trent, where can people go to check you out, dude? You got a bunch of good, great content that you post on a regular basis. Leave a review for the Blissful Prospecting Podcast either. An honest review. Uh, and we like five. Honest review is five stars for us. Um, my name, Trent Russell. You can find me on all socials. Um, I'm most active on YouTube and LinkedIn.